This is Fantology. You may have heard of us. All right, members of the 14th, this is Stephen, your host with Fantology Podcast, and I have my lifelong friend Jake here with me to once again talk about Malazan. We take way too long of a break in between books, and that can be challenging, but we are continuing with the series, and we're up to book six, The Bone Hunters, and we're just talking about the first half. So there are four books within the book, and we're talking about books one and two. Yeah, so part one of the book, which is books one and two. <laughs> yeah, got that? <laughs> and honestly, Malazan is probably one of the more, f- the only time Malazan is forgiving, more forgiving to take time in between because lots of times the new books are just completely different stories to begin with. So, which um, I guess doesn't apply as much here. This is more of a direct continuation from uh, right. House of Chains, but yeah, and but bo- in both books four and five, we, I, I mean, we didn't hit the reset button entirely, but it did kind of start new stories here. But now, uh, we uh, we are continuing with characters that we've seen, you know, since back in Gardens of the Moon. Yeah, and uh, I don't know, like, what, how you want to structure this since it is like a part one. I think it could be kind of fun if we just try to like figure out what's happening and then predictions for the second half of the book yeah which like, is, we'll do our best I mean, yeah if you're like a serious small zon reader and mega fan you're just gonna laugh at us the whole time because have have pity yeah <laughs> yeah we're gonna i mean i feel okay about most of the names because i took some notes but our speculation is gonna be all over the place and we'll probably miss a lot of details but honestly yeah. like if there's one series where that's acceptable i feel like it's this one It's interesting me listening to it. I like I have to re-listen to parts so frequently, but the names are things that like I struggle with, especially like new character names. It takes me like a full book or so to like get those in my head. So like uh, like seeing in our notes, uh, Semar Dev, um, like I would hear that name like, yeah, that's a Malazan name. But (laughs) you know what I mean? Where where I'm thinking back on a character, I'm thinking instead of Samar Dev, my brain remember, oh yeah, the the inventor lady who's accompanying Karsa. You know, like that's, right. I, and Karsa is a name I know, partly because he's been there for um, at least a book now. And also because he's just super memorable. I don't think anyone is ever going to forget or he's not witness yeah. Karsa. <laughs> Karsa is definitely <laughs> one of the better characters we've witnessed thus yeah. far in the story. Let's say we're doing full spoilers. I mean, up to halfway through the Bone Hunters. Yeah. So, okay. you know, starting now, we'll just we'll do that because we just want to kind of talk about the book in this one. And honestly, I don't know who's listening to this that has. I mean, maybe people are trying to tune in to see after reading five should they continue. But I mean, if you're that far into the series, you should, probably should if you're enjoying it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I really liked book five. Um but I get that it could be jarring because it is like a big, basically yeah. a, a big prequel. Um, but I mean, this is a, like, like we said, direct continue continuation of house of chains, the fallout of everything there. Um, plus picking up on some spots that were uh, kind of put on pause from other books, but yeah, um, definitely keep reading. I'm, I'm really enjoying this. I think this has one of the, it doesn't have as good of a start as house of chains, which has the amazing Carsa like chapter after chapter after chapter, you finally get mm-hmm. some continuous like storyline. Um, but I think this one starts out pretty well, like getting familiar with these characters again, you know, seeing Absalar. And I guess I'm skipping the those prologues that are always like, who knows what's happening. And even the, right. well, I will say, even the prologue in this one is a little more straightforward, you know, uh, and again, gonna have to look at the notes for the name but the the salt or i guess he's a divers but uh dejim dejim, dejim nibral nibral yeah yeah um like he's getting freed for whatever reason these gods are deciding to free them and then one mm-hmm. of them and they all get eaten except for one except for the who, one who is i saw uh in my preparation for the episode 
is probably the Lady sister, Envy's sister of, right? Oh, so you already know this. That and I I don't know if I actually got that spoiled or if it is more apparent in there, but mm. I didn't pick um, up on that until I was trying to review. They they do say something about her. I can't remember if they talk about the fact that she has a sister or what, but maybe that was just something that excellently got spoiled for me. But mm. um so, so my yeah. impression it sounds like you're really liking it. There are parts of the first half that I've really liked. And there are some things in the first half of this book that I'm just like, okay, this is dragging on. I'm not really loving these parts. Dra okay. Dragging on more so than Malazan tends to do in general or just general. Yeah, Malazan that's a good question. Because it has, it has been some time since we've read Malazan. So maybe just going back to it is always a little jarring because it d definitely drags on uh, more than most books. I like a lot of slow burn books. I think what I struggle with the most is that I'm reading these long passages and just not really understand over your head. the basic, like I, I'm picking up on some details and names and kind of getting some ideas of what's going on. But sometimes even like the basic motivations for what's happening are not there. And that's just a little frustrating to me. Do you have uh, characters in particular? Like Absalar? She's on this assassination mission for Cotillion. Really unclear what exactly is happening, at, at least to me at this point. So more unclear what Cotillion wants with her. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I get yeah. that she's going through this list of names. And you could say it's kind of like the list of names that uh, another assassin in one of Brandon Sanderson's books is going through. And that's unclear until yeah. the very end. And there's a good reveal. But... I don't know for i think maybe there's just so many of these types of things i don't understand enough where it just becomes a little frustrating especially when it's slower action and i feel like i'm just kind of being like dragged along from philosophical thing to archaeological thing and yeah like uh, what is going on in this book <laughs> Yeah, I think my understanding of Absalar and Cotillion right now is Absalar has agreed to be his assassin. So that way, because she doesn't want Cutter or Crocus. I can, is he Cutter in this book? He's Cutter. Um, no, yeah. uh, basically, like he wanted and like when we left them, the arc was he was trying to become more of an assassin to kind of be able to be with her while not realizing that she didn't want him to be an assassin which is why she decided to take this instead of like, because wasn't in the last book, this was offered to him like these or was, I think that was not the last book with the book before that house of chains. I think so. Sounds, sounds right. So, I mean, that's basically all the motivate or all like the yeah motivation and like plot she's going through that. So I that's understand. good. Maybe what I'm, maybe I just need a reminder of those things every now and then like, I feel like the the series is very unforgiving and if you miss one detail it could like never be repeated again. Yeah. I yeah, that's true. And to be fair, like that's all that's all I really know of what's happening with Absalar right now. Like she's doing work for Cotillion for that motivation and then she's I don't I don't understand what she is what her the significance of her and Perrin meeting a, a lot of that went over my head. Like Perrin kind of shared some plans with her, but she kind of acted like, mm -hmm. I wonder if Perrin is an enemy or a friend right now, which I don't know why they just wouldn't assume that maybe have goals. she does focus on like the last name on her list a few times. Maybe yeah. it's, maybe it's Perrin. Maybe, maybe it's someone. Yeah. I mean, it feels like the last name is more of a person that's going to be hard to kill because of her connection to them rather than like yeah. this is a big boss maybe yeah maybe it's uh tavora maybe that's mm. why i don't know and then cotillion i have no idea what his goal is with killing all these people so far you see her kill one did she even kill one person or she come up on someone who was killed by someone else she only? comes up on someone who was killed by an assassin and of the nameless ones. By the nameless right. ones who 
We know the nameless ones were the ones that raised uh, Dejum ne- ne- yeah. Neval, and yeah. getting vibes that these are like agents of the crippled god, probably. Maybe yeah. Quick was it quick? Then someone like gives some exposition about them saying like, or calls them fools for for anyone worshiping them. I don't remember, but I got the sense that they were like gods that were never that powerful but wanted to be. I don't mm-hmm. know. Um, but then the other part of Cotillion's plot is him trying to figure out how to deal with the crippled God. That's what I got the sense of like him and the, um, whatever Warren that was the shadow Warren, um, the shadow Warren where he's wandering around with the dragons that are chained. Yeah. And talking the to the edge, dragons, edge Walker. Yeah. Person. And, you know, mystery, mystery, whatever's yeah. going on there. And the, the main takeaway from that is like, he's, we, we learned basically that the crippled God is an elder God, right? Because yeah, he says something. I don't know. That's I mean, why I interpreted, like, but I'm not sure if it's Don't true. we kind of already know that based off the history of the crippled God being called down like eons ago? And I, I, I don't know. He's an elder God. I don't know if I knew that. I must have missed that. that like, I know the... he's a new player, but like that's probably in uh memories of ice where we get the backstory because uh that dude who oh the yeah. really super evil guy that killed whiskey jack Calor. his name is yeah Calor. Calor. Yeah. yeah yeah is that is yeah. that right yeah probably. yeah we'll go with that he was involved in all that right and they called down the cripple god in order yeah. to stop him maybe yeah yeah now I remember yeah they didn't really explain why they just did and they chained him yeah okay but yeah, that's our takeaway from Cotillion is he's talking to dragons and Edgewalker yeah. trying to figure out. And then Edgewalker's I'm getting vibes like, that I like. I like Cotillion. I feel like he is yeah. a, a good guy, like a one of the better characters, one that we can kind of cheer for a little bit. Yeah, even though he comes across as kind of like chaotic evil in book one, possessing Absalar and everything. But now at this point, it's, it more seems like Shadow Throne is more that chaotic yeah. side, and Cotillion's Cotillion more seems a little more organized. Even in uh, what was it? Dust. What was the second book? Uh, the second book was called the 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 Path of Dogs. No, um, Chain of Dogs is what happens, but that's not yeah. the right. Uh, because I always confuse House of Chains with Dead House Gates. That's what it is. Dead House Gates. Um, That's the one. Because he he works with uh, Kalam and Dead House Gates, right? He like sets him on some path. Yes. Is that when Kalam picks up that like demon that thing? Weird demon dinosaur thing. The it's like a agape. I don't remember the name of it. Yeah. What but, happened to that uh, thing? Thing was cool. He's gone now. Um, did it die when Kalam to say. attacked uh Lucine? Felicin's or... camp. Felicin's oh, camp. At the end of uh what was that? Book four? Book five? Book, Book four, four, yeah. yeah um possibly. Um Yeah, if you're yeah, like yeah, if you're not realizing by now we are really trying to string the pieces together. <laughs> We're trying to I, I think about this sometimes like I like, man, it would have been a if I had known how complicated this series was. To, uh, before starting and that we'd be reviewing them all this way I think I would have been like all right I need to create some sort of like more robust note-taking thing where I just update here's what I think the state of the series is and where it's going and like I write down every character and blurbs basically like the meme from it's always sunny with, yeah like, we need a we need a board with, with yeah uh, maps and and pictures yeah. and red string everywhere mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. I think Cotillion is seeming much more relatable and like, okay, this is a good guy I can get behind. Um, but yeah, the part that went over the head for me is uh, similarly like not understanding character motivations is like, what is Hiboric doing? Like, why is he heading back to I the Jade no statue? idea what is going <laughs> on with that it. group. Like, that's probably the worst part of the book for me those passages like I, I i complained about the absolar thing which was really like not nearly as bad as i should have led with this one because saboric and cutter and felson 
Younger and Solara and Gray Frog, like they're kind of this weird, quirky group, and it's a little bit funny with Gray Frog, but I have I no like idea Frog. what is happening. And now they're like dead. But I mean, I'm sure they're not dead. Yeah. I yeah. I I I enjoyed reading from those perspectives, but I did not understand why they were why Habork was taking them there. Like he, I like him as a character. I like the arc he had in uh I mean, Dead, Dead House Skates, Skates right? In House of Chains. I liked both of that and like him. I thought it was interesting him being reclaimed by Treach, even though he had like he had like forsaken uh Fenner and then like betrayed Fenner, but then still mm -hmm. yeah, interesting. And like I feel like this might be a moment where they're like, yeah, this Jade statue thing that gave him the ghost hands, um, it's more important, so we have to go back to it. I don't know. I don't really know, understand that. That being said, I really like Solara, and I, I like. I think Gray Fog's pretty funny, and um, I'm interested to see what happens with the Felis and Younger, especially with what we hear from the. Um, was it the Queen of Dreams or who was the one who was like, we need to protect, we need to get a new. Uh, uh new shaik new shaik yeah yeah after leoman yeah betrays everyone and takes up yeah um that is something that happens yeah so i'm 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 interested in felson and like she that was like the temptation she offered to leoman's second korob right to say come with us and that that's yeah. how i that's what I remember, it, at least. And that's how she got what's his name to follow suit as well. Uh, the guy who comes in. Oh, Lorik, right? Lorik, Doesn't yeah. He, he's the one that comes in, right? Yeah, because he was, he, uh, he was protector of the other Felison, and then, um, also was protect trying to protect this Felison. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm excited to see him more because he has like a. Didn't seem like he had a ton of screen time last time, but like all of a sudden there's this like dragon that is was it his dad or just like yeah yeah his yes, dad I remember that I don't remember his dad's name but he was very important yeah right. um anyways I I'm interested with the Felis and stuff as well because first you had Shaikh and then Felis and the older became Shaikh reborn. And now you have Felis and Younger, and again, not related to them by blood at all. But Felis right. and Younger, like her storyline is kind of mirroring Felis and Older a little bit in terms of like being young and suffering all this trauma and now maybe being used by mm -hmm. um, the gods. Or, or yeah, also or, sure, yeah. gods and like being dragged yeah. along on an adventure with the Borg. <laughs> yeah, yeah um yeah but yeah that's so yeah i I'm, i I, could, I think I we're both like there. interested in these characters because they've been with us for a while but through the first half of this book like nothing yeah, has I happened yeah and i just don't get why he needs to touch that jade statue like i i was thinking the storyline would go kind of different like he has those ghosts following him right um, he's he's seeing the land like from millennia ago yeah i don't remember if there's actually ghosts following him or not but he's definitely got some kind of no he does see like spectral visions of the yeah of the previous yeah like the, and... i was thinking maybe he might follow a similar path as a kobe and is by somehow like finding absolution for these lost souls or something i don't know mm. But yeah, really confused with the Jade statue thing. And I don't know if that's because it hasn't been revealed yet or if it's just been so complicated that I couldn't crack it. But the storyline that I've liked more is what's going on with Perrin because yeah, there's not as much just dead time with him, but there was still like this element of mystery as to, you know, what's he trying to do? Getting the, the Hounds of Shadow activated again. They have mm -hmm. a name. What's what's their name? Yeah, the, it starts uh, with a B, I think. The no, the D. Oh, the Dar 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 Daragoth. Yeah, yeah, right. And that whole the whole explanation of how they're related to Dijon Nebril and 
Desimbolakis or whoever, like Desimbol like, yeah, Desimbolakis created Dejim Nimbral, right? And also created the Daragoth and was like yeah. trying to achieve immortality by like splitting his soul or like Voldemort. <laughs> I don't remember exactly well, he, what was happening. He was, I don't remember. Yeah, he was the first imp emperor, right? Or or he was a leader of the old empire or first empire, whatever they call it. Something he was related to the first empire somehow. Because Dejim Nebral's backstory, like he talks about how the first empire should have Yeah. 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 And in the we learned somehow in the first empire, that's where divers and soul taken were created. Like the Symbolakis did some sort of ritual to turn people into mm, that. Okay. But but then he was like, dang, I don't Specifically with Dejan Nimbral, he was like, wait, I messed up. I want to kill you now or get rid of you. But I don't right. know if he felt that way about all of the divers, but it seemed like that was the fall of the, the empire. Was that happening? That's the sense I'm getting from it. I think um, that's a fair assumption we can make for now. I sounds like you recall more of the details than I do. I just kind of remember that these things are all related. But I liked Perrin's storyline because at first it was confusing but I felt like it was confusing for an acceptable amount of time. And then there was an, an explanation for what he was doing and then it paid off and it was cool. And now it seems like he kind of had a smart plan and it's, yeah, it, yeah, it's, I'm really intrigued to see what happens here. If it works out. Same, like the whole thing with him becoming master of the deck in memories of ice, I think was cool, but then like nothing really happened. I was like wanting more from that. I mm -hmm. mean, he, he, uh, what's the word what's there's like a an actual word for it but like he solidified house of chains right and maybe he did that in house of chains not in, yeah that was uh, that was a big device. moment right um, and he kind of had a smart plan around there like you know we're gonna yeah we're gonna chain the crippled god so he has some checks on his power but i think it, i think it's cool like you said i got the sense that he was going to be just this like okay he's in the other realm he's more of a like guy behind the the screen or guy in the chair whatever the phrase is of like being mm -hmm. support from afar and like strategic play but not really interacting so it's cool to see him raise and like an undead army and bring back uh uh what's his name uh hedge hedge yeah yeah <laughs> bring back hedge um and i like so yeah. the interaction with the <laughs> tri tri, tri Gale, the guild whatever they're the, called. Yeah, the traders. Yeah. yeah. That was those that guys was cool. are always fun. I like these like bizarro elements in Malazan. I think they're done pretty well. Like yeah. The, another example is the when Iskarl Pust in like the beginning comes be before a cotillion in Shadow Throne and is like talking out loud even though he thinks he's talking in his mind and it goes back and forth and it just like funny stuff like that. That there is I feel like a lot of it in this book where in previous books i don't know maybe it's just my impression yeah. but I feel like there was like one or two bizarro elements but now there's more anyway it's i like enjoy those skeleton. things and yeah yeah also the right thing. yeah, yeah. to uh, they're tisty eat or right i think they they had possessed a tisty eater at one point because they were speaking to her in that language okay but they definitely they, they're they're they have some because, knowledge that yeah is going to get revealed at some point. They're interesting. They're funny because they're like kind of dumb and ridiculous, but like are it's like a good way to do foreshadowing because they're like, oh, yeah. we can't let the mistress knows. Like they're obviously they're not like on her side, but they're like, oh, of course, mistress. You know, like right. I right. think that's pretty well done. Um. Anyway, to go back to the parent part, just yeah. to tie that one up, like. I, yeah, I enjoyed all those parts. It's been a while since he's been on screen when the uh, like the armored bear thing was coming at him and he throws the card at him and captures yeah. him, you know, the, the Pokemon situation yeah. that was card going on captures. there. And, yeah. Card and captors. Yeah. He's, he's like supposedly says magic words, but really he's just saying like, I hope this works. Yeah. That's a, that stuff yeah. was funny and I thought pretty well done. And then that like epic escape where they're the whole carriage gets wrecked going down through the uh, jagged Warren. Yeah. The name of that Warren. Anyway, like that stuff was all pretty cool and, and fun action. And like probably my favorite part so far was that all that. Who, 
who's the Jack Hut that's with him? What's her name again? It's like yeah, she she has a name. Is she has a name that sounds like someone else's name with the lisp on it? That's what I remember. Do not remember her name, and I'm also not sure if she has more significance or not. Well, she's like she she seems like she's a jag vet who just got freed and is on some quest, right? And I assumed it had something to do with Dejan Nimbral because she's like some spell to stop something has broken, but mm. I don't know. Okay. I'm going to look her up. Her name. Yeah, look her up. Other things. Oh, I also like that Kreppa got a little bit of time. Sounds like he's not going to be a main character in this book, but it yeah. was fun to just like see him for a few pages with Perrin. Yeah. If I if I could complain about one more thing, I felt like in Malazan there are several really good established characters, but there are also a lot of characters who just kind of feel like kind of bleed into copy, each other. Just copies of other characters with different names. I think the the worst example of this is all of the Malazan officers and yeah, not even officers, just like all those characters. Like, yes, they're distinct, but they don't really have any distinct voices to them. And so it's really hard as a reader to separate these things. Even when we talk about like the bizarro elements, like the Iskral Pust versus Absalar's little companions, the things they say, like it could be, you know, like there's really no separation sometimes. And yeah. I feel like if I was just to open a page of a book and start reading randomly, there's a good chance I'd be confused which character is here. And I know there's a lot of characters, so that's fair. But at the same time, I feel like most books spend more time separating out character voices and there's just not a lot of effort done here in that regard. Yeah. And I wonder if, wonder how intentional that is it being like a military. I'm, I'm struggling reading because halfway through these books, they switched narrators. And now like all those voices that had like all the voices of people who had already appeared are now different oh, really? in general. And mm -hmm. like, like quick Ben sounds like a crazy old wizard now where, where in the first audiobook he felt like a young, like normal. Halfway through this book or this book, they switched to a different I think, one. I think uh house of chains that switch narrators okay. so halfway I through try to listen a little so bit far. but i i mostly just read because i cannot focus yeah enough on these ones i i agree though and i i just assumed it had something to do with the, the narrator switch but like some of them are getting their own personalities for sure and like like bottle mm -hmm. like i know who bottle is you know like yeah he's got interesting things going on that tie back to uh was that in Midnight Tides, we've, I think, yeah, I feel like we've seen this like ape beast goddess that visited him in a book before. I feel like I have this unlocked, but I'm, it's slipping mm. from me. Are you talking about the vision that he experienced during the, uh, the honey scene? Uh, he saw her there, but also before, uh, okay. before the siege. But yeah, yeah, her. She's uh, she the aerosol or something like that. Um. Anyways, that that's mm. interesting. And then he he uses holds. Maybe that's why I'm connecting him to Midnight Tides because he uses holds instead of uh, Warrens. Um. But yeah, so Bottle is more memorable, obviously Fiddler. Um. But a lot of the other ones. Um, like there, one of them just died. I feel like I just met the guy and, and he died by sacrificing himself in the siege. And then, um, well, no, so that, I mean, that was a character that we've seen before and was significant. Uh, oh, was it? Yes, it was truth, right? Like this was one of the, one of the, uh, Malzons that was ab aboard the Solara and got that kind of protection whatever was going on there what is that or no the, the salandra salandra the ship is that the the ship and the warren with the headless yes to see eater hmm. yeah when they like landed it on the edge of seven cities and whatever book that was what anyway protection like this... did he get from that 
uh him and two other malls like one of them is off with kalam and quick ben and like and fell off of one of the sky keeps and was hurt but they're like oh he's fine because he's got the blessing from mm. the Solan solandra solanda whatever it is anyway he... yeah truth has been around for a while but he sacrificed himself and apparently you know exploding in a fiery inferno is not protected yeah I didn't remember him at all. That's my bad then. I was just like, well, no, isn't... I mean, I, th I think that's oh, gets to a little bit of my issue of these, these characters just yeah. lead into each other too much. Yeah. Speaking of the honey scene, I thought that was really cool. That was some interesting uh, exposition, the way they do it like that. And like Fiddler sees Hedge, doesn't he? That was fun. Yeah. And then. Uh... And kind of gives him, a little, gives Fiddler some, foreshadowing and a purpose of like you know you've got to yeah. do something and yeah yeah um I and it was it was well placed too because chapter seven which we haven't really talked about yeah it was just kind of hurtling along and so it was nice to have a bit of a slowdown through all that yeah chapter seven i think was probably one of it might be my favorite part of the um the favorite part to read so far it was just a really w well done battle scene which we've seen some battles in malazan but generally it's been more like the chain of dogs wasn't really a battle as much as like mm -hmm. um There's several small battles along yeah the campaign. whereas this is yeah. one extended uh battle that i thought was yeah. done really well although would you even call it a battle like i was going into it i thought it was going to be a big long battle and i saw the chapter was like a hundred pages long or whatever. And it started off as a fight. And so I was thinking that's what we're going to get here. And then all of a sudden it turned into this fiery hellscape and then, you know, escape crawl through the tunnels. Like it was all, I thought it was really good. It was, it was certainly a highlight of the book so far, but maybe yeah. not what I was expecting when I, when we started the fight for Giga 10. Yeah. Maybe that's why I liked it. Cause it, just developed so naturally and like the stakes stayed high while developing it was a battle like in the first um part of it though like right it seemed it like we were certainly setting up for the siege and yeah we'd been you know we had some foreshadowing and some maybe not foreshadowing but we had some glimpses into both sides of the camp some and suspense some suspense of like what the yeah, plans are some uncertainty yeah. of what the yeah what the plans were exactly and lots of tension and so it was all set up really well and then subverted in kind of a cool way. Yeah. Um, I'm interested to see if, like, why does Bottle, like, if this rat that he's connected to has more purpose. And the whole aerosol thing, I wonder, I don't know if that is um, supposed to be. it. I was thinking of the part in Midnight Tides where Who's the slave guy? A slave of the Tissy Eater. He's a lethery. Yeah. Dang, I'm what so bad it, with yeah. names. He no, I know you're talking about, but I don't remember. He gets, his name. He gets Udanas, this like Udanas? Is that is that it? Yeah, Udanas, I think. So he gets uh there's a wraith following him, and then this other shadow beast bites him. And he's like dying, but then the wraith is like helping keep alive. And he is in this fever dream where a different goddess sees him and like rapes him. Um, right. I might have been conflating thinking that was this lady, but I don't think that this mm. uh, goddess, maybe it was. I don't know. I have no thoughts but, on this, but um, interesting. <laughs> the other part that I think might be my favorite is it's a lot shorter. So I don't know if it's my favorite part I've read so far, but. Carsa Orlong, like wrestling the demon, uh, like for that whole the whole chapter was so the big cool. lizard thing. I think it was supposed to be a uh, um, Kachin Shamal, right? Or uh, oh, was it just a short tail? I think it was a, sh a short tail. Yeah, I got the vibe that is like really big. Which are Kachin Shamal much bigger than Carsa? I don't know. That's what I assumed it was, but we did. It might be because we were just getting a lot of Kachin Shamal um, injections into the story again, which I'm always down for. Some more uh, dino civilizations sounds uh -huh. pretty cool. 
Um, yeah, that part was cool. Although looking back, it's like what? I'm why? Not sure, I'm not sure what the significance was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of um, a step, a step towards Leon and the rest of the group going towards Yigatan, and it was yeah introducing the book and maybe just reminding us that Carsa is cool. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I have no idea what Carsa's uh plotline is gonna entail. Where's he where's he going now? I'm trying to remember. So he's it, headed off with Samar Dev to this island. What is the name of the island? Set Sepic? Something like that. But it's, why is he headed there again? Like, yeah, I don't know. Do... I don't think we know. He did I feel like he had a motivation to leave the island, but I don't think it was related to Samar Dev. Dev got yeah. some info. There was a map. Yeah. Yes, there there was a map, and he was like, "Can we get a copy of the map and go right now?" And there was some discussion about that. I I don't remember the reason for what is happening. Yeah, there. I like her. She's cool. Some are Dev. They're a fun yeah. pairing together. She has. Ours is, yeah. She's a little more unique. Like this is a unique pairing that I feel like their voices are are fun to read and, and distinct from other characters. No bleed over here. So I like that. Um, yeah. And Kars is just great to read from as horrible as a, a individual as he can be. Like he has such gravitas, like any scene with him and it is going to be entertaining to read. I feel like, um, and I feel like I mean, summer death is a good, he definitely companion started off as a really horrible individual earlier in his storyline, but I feel like, I mean, he's still somewhat barbaric compared to uh, other characters, but I think he's softened up a little bit. He still does. I think his biggest flaw right now is he has no respect for life. Like if someone is annoying him, he will kill them. And like, yeah, just consider it like part of life. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's, his journey has been so cool because he he started off like really like bl lots of bloodlust and like wanted glory through subjugating others and murdering others and pillaging and all that but he always had uh like this sense of honor and as rigid and like ignorant as he is it's been so cool to see moments of him realize like no this is the honorable thing to do i'm doing this now you know and kind of adjust his his worldview that way I'm missing out on the uh the commentary from his friend who'd always say war oh, leader yeah. that's how he talks <laughs> in, the, in the book he's like war leader yeah but I'm, i um, think that uh carsa and akarium are gonna meet up because akarium is kind of in that area around the island and akarium has acquired a new companion that is taking advantage of his memory loss. Yeah. Well, the, I feel like this is one of those things that uh, Ikarium is going to be like a pivotal character in the last book and either site, like helping defeat the crippled God or like being someone they have to overcome against the crippled mm. God. Um, but and I feel like I'm trying to make sense of the storyline. So it seems like the De Dejo Nimbral was released to take out Mapo, right? I thought he was going for Ikarium. Do you think do you think it's Mapo? Oh, because the Nameless One released him, but then the Nameless Ones were talking to Mapo afterwards, saying like, "You left your yeah, you yeah, quit your okay. responsibility." Okay. So, and I didn't really understand this, but like. And then he has that new companion. And I assumed, oh, that's the new person they want leading. The companion, did, you, you picked up the, the companion, uh, whatever, the like Veed or something like that. Yeah, what's his whatever name? The, yeah, uh, Tarlock Veed. He was, he was in the book earlier, just for a few snippets, and he was always following Dejan. Yeah, yeah, ex yeah, exactly. Okay, so yeah, you no, you helped me kind of put that together a little bit more. Yeah. So so he was that, he was following Dejan Nibral, so that way he could replace right, Mapo. So he could replace Mapo. And once he became Akarium's companion, he unloaded the information that Mapo had been keeping from him. Yeah. And it sounds like with with Mapo and Akarium, Akarium has 
was given some purpose and it's nefarious. And so Mapo helped him realize that. And, but because of the memory loss, Mapo is like, I need to stay with him to stop him from like accidentally fulfilling this purpose. And whereas he was probably sent to, it seems like the, the nameless ones were saying Mapo was originally sent to make sure Ikarian right. fulfilled this purpose. Um, that sounds right. And now Tarlac is going to do that. A little confused why we need to release freaking Dedrum yeah. uh, Neverall yeah. in order to take out Mapo. Like, Mapo doesn't no, seem that tough. Yeah, like he's yeah. he's certainly tough. Like he's, you know, he's a capable fighter, but there are a lot of really strong things out here. And yeah, this, this Nebral thing seems like it's it seems like it's an ascendant level. Yeah, threat. like like this we're releasing all the hounds of the shadow to try to take it out. So did it just maybe a little Akarian? over? It's like a little overkill for Mapo. <laughs> How did that play out? Like Mapo got taken out, and then yeah, Mapo got taken out, did... and then and then uh, it was going to finish off Mapo, and Iskral Pust showed up oh. and fought him off. <laughs> that's that's right, and like okay, maybe he isn't an ascendant level threat because Iskral Pusk is like a priest of shadow, right? So he's got he's right. like high up there, but he's not a warrior, you know. I mean, so I, I see I see a Nebral as more of a a real strong brute force type thing that can do a lot of damage, but can also be outsmarted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Pusk has yeah, some Iskral, good moments. Yeah. Pusk is another one of those characters yeah. that is just absurd, but adds a lot of, uh, I think my favorite uh, part with him was when he released the fish into the lake and then talks about how he's looking forward to going fishing, but yeah. little does he know his wife has released the sharks into the lake. Yeah. <laughs> What uh, what was happening with like the moon? She was like stealing light from the moon to weave something. I'm trying to remember that. I feel like that had an played an important role as well. Not totally Man. sure, but I just forgot about that till just now. I mean, it was basically just a hill mapo. Yeah, but it, like, but the light of the moon disappearing um like was affected significant. affected someone else's plot. I thought. Maybe not. No, you're right. It was like noticed somewhere else. Yeah, but they're interesting. I say it was like, I'm just sorry, was it Kalam who noticed it? <clears throat> yeah, something I like could, that. I could be way off. It was someone like yeah. very disconnected. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder what the 14th army is going to do now. And also, I wonder how fiddler and company are if they're going to go back to the 14th they're technically dead right or and they deserters. talked about they talked about using this opportunity to strike yeah. dead on their own and we've seen this happen with the other bridge burners who are just chilling out in Darugistan right now at yeah the, at the bar with diker yeah diker's telling them the story of the chain of dogs yeah. still <laughs> it's a long story um, man it took, took me a long time to read the story yeah <laughs> um i guess we we could probably go into predictions for the second half now right um yeah so it seemed like it was more uh, again more of a war story in the first half with the big thing yeah. between Liama and, and and eradicating the last of this rebellion and the fight with yugatan and several of the other books have been big wars or big sieges but I don't That's see over now. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't see the second half setting up that way. Like it seems like the more military side of thing has, is done for this book at least and now we're focused more on this, you know, yeah. ascendant god fantasy clash of some big heavy hitters. So, like Drijna is over, like Leoman of the Flails is still out there, yes, but he has no army. Potentially it could start up again if Phyllis and Younger becomes Shaikh, mm. but I don't and see that. I remember there was also a plotline earlier where I don't remember who this was, but they insinuated that the crippled god would be trying to harness the whirlwind, harness Drishna, right? And so I well, think he did. Part of, he did in House of Chains, right? Is that already done? I guess I thought they were yeah, saying he, he did that, right? I felt like. 
I don't know, I was getting some vibes that when they were saying we need to find another Shaikh, it was almost like, so no one else does. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that might just be tying up a loose end, if anything, rather than... Yeah, yeah, maybe it's not a big deal. We haven't seen the crippled god in this book. Yeah. After, after he came on and was a fairly big player in the last few... And it started to, you know, hint towards this is like the end game for the series. Like this is the Thanos character. He's been present in his absence so far. Yeah. And I'm getting I'm getting the sense that a lot of the plot lines he's been involved with haven't been a cohesive effort on his part. It's been more like seeing yeah. opportunities and going for, like the shy thing, seeing that yeah. opportunity. Other than maybe Rulon. I remember we talked about this before. I, I like that take of he's very chaotic and he's got a lot of balls that he's juggling. And whenever yeah. an opportunity comes his way, he just kind of goes for it. Yeah. And I I do think it's all part of his greater plan and that it's like causing that chaos and like and is like uh, causing pain in the world. But I don't see it as much as like now that I did this with Drijna, this unlocks a path over here. It's more like. It's more like uh, uh -huh. he's trying to do like death by a thousand cuts kind of thing. Like take just other than keep it all moving than, and eventually yeah. opportunities will open themselves for me. Like with the Panion Seer. As, was that him? I think it was. He was definitely involved. I don't yeah. remember exactly how though. Um, Other than maybe Rulad though. I wonder if Rulad is um, like an end game play for him forgot about that um, guy yeah because like i don't know he put a lot of effort into that and they are definitely still a force in the world that hasn't been resolved which means they've been around for a mm -hmm. decent amount of time compared to his other plans um but yeah okay. so, I, so I, yeah, yeah I what, are, what see, are you seeing i mean i i, I don't see the shaikh thing yeah. really being a uh like a end game moment for this book um I have no idea what Kars is going to get into. I'm hoping we get to see, this is more of a hope than a prediction. I hope we get to see him confront the forces of the crippled God in some way, since he was like refused being the knight, but he, I think still is the knight of chains. Um, <clears throat> I want to see that interaction. Um, I'm hoping we see Perrin, like a Perrin crippled God confrontation as well. Like I want to see him have an, I want to see part of his plan be part uh be a focus of the climax. You want to see get some sense of how Perrin's plan to legitimize the crippled god is going. Was it a good idea? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then I want to know who the bone hunters are. We're halfway through the book. Haven't seen many bones. Don't know <laughs> what's happening there. I did look ahead, at, not like reading ahead, but I just looked at the titles of the books and book four is called the bone hunters so yeah that's how most of his his by uh, that point i think that's how most of the books are structured are like all of the them last like that? book is the name yeah, can, of... yeah that might be how all of them are yeah um <laughs> i've stumbled upon a great uh insight here <laughs> <laughs> do you think absolar is going to confront that last name at the end of this book or is that a longer play I like my theory that it's Perrin. And if it is, I feel like it really fits in this book. It would be yeah. a nice tie-in. I mean, there's certainly some plot lines that have been around, that have been established since book one, that we haven't mm. really seen come to fruition. But there are also, you know, a good amount that just bear out within the course of a book. And I feel like this one, I, I don't know. I, I, I hope this one ties up in this book. It, it would be... I want those resolutions. Yeah. Uh, just a thought. I was going through like the other groups of people. No idea what Heboric's like end of book is going to look like at all. Well, they're dead. But, <laughs> are, I mean, and that's the other thing. Like, I mean, they're definitely not dead. But um, dude, like Cutter was holding his guts and Heboric was getting stabbed over and over. Just a flesh wound. <laughs> um well they might be dead but they're not out of the story i'll say that um yeah the, uh, the presence of all the flies makes me think hood yeah right especially from it that 
epic scene in the prologue of Ed House Gates, right? When the when that priest is going Yeah. down the town and gets consumed by the flies. Very Yeah. similar vibes of what's going on here. So perhaps Hood enters the fray here in a bigger way. Yeah. Hood's Hood seems cool. I wish we got more from him, but I think it makes sense that you don't see a lot of him. There was a little hint that uh, Kalam was more heavily involved with Hood, which we Yeah. kind of know already, right? Yeah, I do kind of uh, conflate Hood and Shadow Throne at times, but Yeah. he was definitely working for Cotillion and House and Dead House Gates, right? I think he was. Hard Not to say. Hood. I don't know. Um, I but speaking of their group of people, Solara is pregnant, and it keeps talking about. It mentioned a couple times that she's like, I don't even know who the father is. Like it could be anybody, just because of like her circumstances. I'm hoping, uh, I don't know if I'm hoping, it'd be cool if her baby was somehow uh, deified in some way or something like that. You know what I mean? Like maybe Mm -hmm. it was, it's part of a God's plan. Or honestly, for Solara, it'd be nice if it's just a normal baby and she can overcome her trauma and go settle down and raise this child outside of Yeah. uh A lot of characters in Malazan are able to settle down and overcome their trauma. I think it's a big theme of the series. Yeah. 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 She can just chill on the Adataro Island. <laughs> No magic can harm her there. Yeah. uh huh. Yeah, it'll be Um, a good time. There's probably some beaches on that island. Good, yeah, good there times. are. Good times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think we're going to see anything more with Kachin Chamal in the, in this book? Like any major developments there? Uh. Well. We have those like 10 sky keeps that are hanging out Yeah. in that Imperial Warren. Kalam and friends are out of those uh, kind of out of that area, but Yeah. Is the Imperial yeah. Warren the same as the Shadow Warren? No, I don't think so. The, the Imperial Warren, they were speculating in this book that the Imperial Warren may be the original Kachin Shmael Warren. Okay. Okay. I was thinking, I always thought they were the same because Shadow Throne um, was the emperor of... Yeah. The Malazan Emperor, right? Anyways, okay. I Okay, feel like that they're makes different, sense. but could Okay. be wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I hope we get more of Quick Ben. Quick Ben is a Yeah. mysterious character and he's been on screen here in this book for longer than he's been for several other books. I feel like he's, he's another character that's often conspicuous in his absence and people are talking about him and wondering what's going on with him. And I, I would like to know. So I hope we get more of that. Yeah. And people in like the Malazan community really like him and like, he's cool. And we have, we got that cool backstory of him during the first seven cities campaign of like, basically he has like, like seven plus other people's souls in him. And that's how he has access to so many Warrens. And, but like, yeah, it'd be cool to see, I'd like to see him uh, play a bigger role and get more inside Mm. yeah of his head. let's unleash him a little bit more Yeah. there's a lot of heavy hitters that and in this book especially i feel like i feel like there are so many different plot lines and it jumps around to a lot of characters and now that we're six books saying it can do that because we've established a lot of these people so it really could set up for an exciting ending I've heard people tell me that like the series that the bone hunters is one of their favorites. Really? Yeah, I think right now, um, and we'll do like a, obviously a, a more established ranking once we finish the book, but I think I like Memories of Ice and Midnight Tides the best so far, but I'm, I'm liking this one a lot. I I'm liking where things are going. I feel like we got a, in uh like chapter nine or 10, we got a really good info dump. from Perrin of explaining like, these are Yeah. Warrens, this is a cripple Finally. God, you know, like, Where um, was this? This should be in the Ars Arcanum. <laughs> yeah. Like it would have been nice to, to <laughs> get a lot of that information in book one or two, but um, yeah. good to get some confirmations there. And some interesting ideas that kind of hit back to uh, some of your ideas that you're talking about in your world building where like 
gods level up based yeah. on the amount of belief yeah. that they you know the amount of followers they have and they can be demoted or promoted and yeah, yeah cool. like with like uh giving the treach backstory of he was one of the first heroes and now i want to read a book about the first heroes that's just sounds cool like the mythos of that um there might getting... be there are like there are lots of spin-offs different little series. i know i think i own through that humble bundle and the audible deal i think i own like 80 percent of them now i just gotta get obviously gotta get through <laughs> right all, but... yeah it'll, it'll take some time yeah anyways yeah i'm i mean i'm liking it there were i feel like i have some complaints but maybe i'm just voicing some issues that i've had for a while with the series it's certainly not my like miles on is not my exact cup of tea yeah but i do really like i like the complexity but sometimes it's just frustrating for me and i can't get past that yeah i wish yeah i'm hoping by the end of it that we do get like i don't need an answer to everything but i i hope we get a complete understanding of um like all these things are like this is happening i don't know why like i hope you get a better understanding of like right. intense yeah right intentions um i would say malazan right now is probably in my top five fantasy series um okay it's pretty good yeah for am i i think uh like ones that have recently entered are abercrombie and malazan so in darker yeah jake's in jake's top five <laughs> <laughs> anyways uh i'm excited to keep going it was interesting reading lightbringer after this like such a faster read but i'm excited to jump back in cool well if you are enjoying what we're doing or have anything to say about our or speculation or you know want to correct us which some people do that is that is fine you know just politely let us know what we got wrong i'm sure there were some things you can just drop us a comment, obviously on YouTube or wherever, or you can hop on our Discord. Invites are on the episode description below and check out all the other stuff we've reviewed, including the rest of Jake's dark top five. <laughs> <laughs> all right, see you later. See you guys.